holy, holy dissatisfaction. Holy dissatisfaction is the thing that will bring about growth in your life. Holy dissatisfaction is the thing that will force you to take an honest look at your life. Not only what you do, but why you do it, your motives, it'll holy dissatisfaction will keep you on, will keep you before God, saying, Thank you, God, for how far you brought me. What's next? What now? Because I'm ready. I signed on to follow you. Jesus told his first disciples, follow me. And somebody tells you to follow him, doesn't that indicate that it's a journey? That he's going to take you someplace? Um, if, if I say, Jerry, follow me, and he follows me across the room and we just sit here for the rest of our lives, there's something weird and pointless about that. You follow Jesus because he's going to take you somewhere. And so we can't. If we sit around perfectly content with where we are and how far he's led us, well, it's not that we're in danger of going to hell. It's that we are simply not going to experience all he wanted us to. We're not going to touch other people the way we could have. We're not going to have the kind of spiritual depth and Christ-likeness that he wanted us to have. Holy dissatisfaction. Now, soon as you open the Gospels, you start running in to some men who had a holy dissatisfaction. I'm talking about the first disciples, the original disciples. Jesus walked past them. Matthew, sitting at the tax collector booth. Peter, James, and John, mending their nets on the beach. Follow me, follow me, follow me. They got up and they followed him because he was going somewhere they'd never been. He knew some things they didn't know. He knew some things that their previous teachers did not know. And it was time to go. It was time for more. And how do I know that those disciples were dissatisfied with their current spiritual life? How do I know that they were dissatisfied and hungry for more? Here's how. It's very obvious. They jumped right on it. Let's go. Drop everything. Let's go. It didn't take a lot of deliberating. They didn't have to, they didn't have to write out a list of pros and cons and try to figure out which was the most advantageous. They just went. And here's why. These men had been brought up in the synagogue. They knew some very important things about God. They knew there was one God. They knew that he was a holy God. They may have even understood that he was a God of love along with being a God of justice. They understood that this was a God who had worked among their ancestors. But this God had never really worked in their personal lives. You can relate to them. I know you can, unless you're very unusual. I sure do. At points in my life, I so relate. Don't you remember, or do you remember, those of you who grew up in church, do you remember the Sunday school lessons that the sweet little old ladies would teach us and the, the young mothers would teach us? These thrilling, exciting Bible stories. 
I was hungry for that. I took that in. But what I also took in, almost unconsciously, was this idea. Boy, God sure did some wonderful stuff back then. Too bad it's not like the Bible days anymore. Too bad God doesn't really speak anymore. He doesn't actually interact with individual people. And sure, he sure is not going to interact with somebody like me. Why would he? You see, those teachers, they taught me exactly what they were supposed to. And what they taught me was totally true. I needed to know those Bible stories. I needed to know those basic things about God. But what if I'd stopped right there? I'd have nothing to say to you that you've not already heard 10,000 times. Or what if when I was 18 years old and graduated from high school and the church youth department, I stopped right there. I've got it. I've got it. I know all kind of stuff that I didn't know when I was in fifth grade. Whoa, I, I, by the way, at 18, I was a religious know-it-all. I'd already started preaching a few places. And everywhere I went, it was to enlighten all these, these blind people, these grown-ups who just didn't know much. Which shows what, how blind I was and how little I knew. But can you imagine how silly that would have been? But I want to tell you the truth. The serious truth is that churches all across this country, and especially in the Bible Belt, are filled with people who have really not ventured into anything new. They've not gone any deeper. They've not pursued God any farther than they did when they were, say, 18 or 19. You know, when it comes to education, uh, they say that most people, most, most, most people stop learning and stop studying whenever they graduate from their highest level of education, whether that be high school, bachelor's, master's, whatever, they tend to stop. There are very few lifelong students. Well, the same applies in the spirit. The same applies in our relationships with God. Most of us stopped learning and we shut down long about age 18, maybe 21. And there's been very little change. Now, let me say this. If when you were 18 years old, you were like me and you really did know it all, and you had the correct interpretation of every issue in the Bible and all of Christianity. If you knew all of that and you had it all right, then I don't want to mess with you. I mean, you better stay like you are. Please stay like you are. But all the rest of us didn't know it all then, and we don't know it all now. And we know that. And you know what that creates? Holy dissatisfaction. In the words of one of my favorite, no, my very favorite hymn, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights gaining every day. That's my life song. It's a life, it's, it's a great life song that describes many of you. It describes those disciples. They were dissatisfied with what they had, with what they knew. They just sensed in their guts, there's got to be more. Do you ever, have you ever found yourself coming home from church or driving to church and asking yourself, either in your mind or out loud, isn't there more to it than this? 
God, tell me, this is not all there is to it. I am not fulfilled spiritually. It's like big chunks are empty and, and I don't, and I don't, I don't have the kind of excitement I had when I was 12 or when I was 18. Why can't I go back to that? Well, let me say this very clearly. If you were like me and at age 18, in spite of all the things you didn't know, you were on fire for God. And you were filled with excitement and joy and energy and desire to know him more. Do you know one of the reasons you felt like that when you were 18? It's because up until age 18, you had been seeking and finding and asking and receiving and knocking and opening and you had been learning and growing. And the result of all that was a very exciting faith. But if you stopped right there, when you could have been, and, and I'm going to say should have been, continuing to do all that, and you let 10 years pass, God help us, maybe 50 years passed. No wonder you're asking, isn't there more? Thank God the answer is yes, there's more. And I'm not saying, yes, there's more, because I'm the one who knows all about what's more. I'm saying it because God, with God, there's always more. Why do you think heaven has to be forever? It's because you're never going to get to the end of God. His mercies are new every morning, and his mysteries are new. Those disciples, they got it. They were hungry. But did you know something about them? Not only had they grown up in synagogue, going to the temple, learning the basics, several of these disciples had taken a whole nother big step, a big important step. You know what they'd done? They had discovered John the Baptist before Jesus came on the scene. They found out about John the Baptist. And for the very first time in their lives, they were, they were listening in person to this flesh and blood man who seemed to have the very same spirit and the very same intense connection with God that they had only read about and heard about up until then. For them to meet John the Baptist was like meeting somebody out of the Scripture. The distant past, and they realized, hey, maybe God's just doing something here. Now, after all, I can get in on it. And they did. And they learned everything they could from John the Baptist. And then one day, as they sat with John the Baptist, their teacher, a surprising event unfolded. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. And this is John the Baptist. Standing with two of his disciples, as Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. When two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. I don't know how many of John's disciples heard this and followed Jesus. I just know two of them did. How many others were there? We're not told. One more? 30 more? Don't know. It doesn't matter. But two of them realized. They realized this is so much more amazing than I could have ever dreamed. 
it just blows our minds. It blows my mind that we have met this John the Baptist and that he is living, breathing, spiritual power like we read about with Elijah in, the, in our Bible or Moses. That's amazing enough. And God's given us the opportunity to learn from him. That is mind-blowing. But this next part is mind-exploding because John himself says, hey, you've been looking at me. You've been listening to me. That's what you were supposed to do. But now I got to point you to one that's way beyond me. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John went on to say, I must decrease and he must increase. Meaning, my influence, my ministry is going to shrink from here on. His is going to grow. And what a miracle. A miracle that gets no attention at all. You know what that little miracle was? John the Baptist was okay with that. How many men and women, I mean successful, influential, powerful men and women, do you know who would reach a point in life where they saw very clearly that they had pretty well done all they were meant to do and that now they were to turn all of their influence and point all of their followers to someone else. Not many could do that. You know why? A little three-letter word. Ego. Through the years, the last few years in particular, God has shown me again and again how much of my behavior, how much of my attitude, my actions, and my words were driven not by the Spirit of God, but by my ego. And it is actually scary because so many things are done in the name of God. I'm doing this for Christ. And yet it just so happens I get the glory for it. I get the attention for it. I get the good reputation for it. Ego is a dangerous thing. And it will keep you stuck if you let it. It will, it will not, it will tell you, don't you dare let people know that you're not a know-it-all after all. Don't you dare give up that influence. That's what ego is saying. Because it, it's all about preserving what you got. Holding on to what I got, to this life I've got. I like it. You know what Jesus said? No. If you seek to save that life, holding on to that, you'll lose it. But if you will lay down that ego, lay down that ego at the feet of Jesus Christ, and say, now, Lord, what would you have me do? Teach me, for I'm empty, and I'm open, and I'm broken, and I want you to put me to get back together in the right way. Ego. One more note on the ego. I said that it will prevent you from letting go of your power and influence and respectability when, you, when it's time to let it go. And so you got to do like John and let go anyway. But here's what's even more common. Ego always has to be in the know. Ego has always got to be right. Ego cannot stand the thought that I might be wrong about anything. You've often heard me mention how many adults in this world there are 
whom you will never hear say the words, I was wrong. We, you pick any random group. I'm not even saying this church. You just pick a church. And if you were to honestly investigate each person in that church, I think you'd be doing well if you found 10% who could look you in the eye when they're wrong and say, I'm wrong. You know what the rest are going to say? They're going to say, well, sorry you took it that way. They're going to explain it away. They're going to give you their excuses. That's ego, and that will keep you stuck. Not only will it keep you in ignorance, that's bad enough, but it will, worst of all, it will keep you from following Christ any further. Because some of us get to this point in following Christ where we've kind of got a good reputation. You know, people listen to me. They respect my advice. And Lance, are you trying to tell me that I need to be willing to surrender that? And honestly pray and say, God, thank you for how far you've brought me. Thank you for all you've taught me. God, I humbly say, I know there's more. And I want to walk with you into it. I want to follow you forward. My life's not done at 45, at 55, or even 65. This is a journey following Christ. Do you realize something else? Say as a parent, for example, or a grandparent. If you stop growing and stop learning and you settle into ego mode and you don't budge, you are doing your children and grandchildren a great disservice for a lot of reasons. One is you're going to teach them a false lesson. You're going to teach them that Christianity is really just about making sure you're right and being able to prove that other people are wrong. What a ridiculous definition of Christianity. You will also, if you're not careful, remain stuck where you are and your children, some of your children, you will have done such a good job of training and teaching, they will have fallen in love with Jesus Christ. And whereas once you were their teacher, they will keep growing and they'll keep walking and following until they pass you. And what are you going to do then? Are you going to have the humility to actually learn from your own child? Ask their opinion. Now, I'm not saying <clears throat> that we can learn from all of our children. And that we can learn everything there is to know from any of our children. But I'm saying, if your 30-year-old son has been growing ever since he accepted Christ 20 years ago, and you stopped 20 years ago, chances are he's past you. And this isn't a competition, it's simply a wake-up call to generate some holy dissatisfaction and say, hey, this is not about catching up with him, this is about catching up with Jesus. Because Jesus said, follow him, and I just, just stopped back there where it was so comfortable. On this little level where I had all the answers. Remember how I said, at one time in your life, God put people who taught you exactly what you needed to know at that time. Important stuff, true stuff that you got to hang on to. 
But that kindergarten teacher could only take you so far. Then came your junior high youth leader, who, in my case, transformed my life, got me started in a personal relationship with Christ. She could only take me so far. My question to you is this. Who is your spiritual mentor now? Now. Who is it that you are currently intentionally learning from? Because you realize they've got something you don't have that they've gone farther and that you're able to separate the ego part out of that, whether they're older than you or younger than you, and you can say, I just want to grow. And you seem to know some things I don't know. You seem to be strong in your prayer life in some ways I'm not. You seem to have the ability to handle stress in ways I cannot. I'm missing something, and I admit it. Can you teach me what you know? You needed a mentor, a teacher, when you were 16. You need that when you're 46. You will need it when you're 96. question is, will you be humble enough to open up, to listen? And to learn. Now there's an old saying. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. You see, let me say it again. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Why do I emphasize that? Because a few minutes ago when I asked, who is your mentor now? Who's your spiritual Role model now. If you could not answer that question, I'm afraid many probably could not answer that question, didn't have an answer. It's probably because you didn't realize you needed one. And that's okay. That's not some horrible sin. It just means you were unconscious of something that you needed to discover just as the disciples of John needed to discover it, just as I have to rediscover it over and over through the course of my life. You see, 10 minutes ago when I asked that question, you didn't have an answer as to who your teacher was going to be because you were satisfied. You may not have used those words, But based on the way you were operating, you were satisfied with where you were and there was no desire or even a thought that I might need somebody to lead me further. Now there is. And this whole message has been for one purpose, to demonstrate and spread some holy dissatisfaction. And now that you're ready, bank on it. The teacher will come. God is never without witness. Wherever there is one of his children seeking, God will ensure they find. For he's already promised it. And he's got to keep it. You seek a teacher, you will find it. If you're ready. Ian's going to lead us in song. Not sure just what he's going to do, whether it's instrumental, vocal, but whatever it is, I want this to be a time of quiet worship, quiet reflection, open, honest before God, Because let me tell you what's going to happen. Once you walk out those doors and you get in your car and you get into conversations and you turn the radio home on and you get home and turn on the television, all this stuff is going to fade away fairly quickly. 
But while the Spirit is speaking, listen. And don't just listen. Make a promise to God. I will see a teacher, whatever that means, whatever form that takes. 